All right, everyone, welcome to lecture 8-2 on the mediastinum. The mediastinum is the central portion of the thoracic cavity. Uh, so when you think about the mediastinum, you're typically thinking about the heart, the aortic arch. There's some other contents we're going to talk about, though. So here is a radiographic image of the thorax from an AP view. Uh, in this AP view, you know, uh, you can see a number of different structures. The uh, border of the diaphragm, uh, where the uh, liver is below the diaphragm, we can see the outline of the pericardial sac here. Of course, we can see the uh, vertebrae, the collarbone, uh, clavicle, of course, and um, you know, various other structures. Uh, to a uh, trained uh, radiologist, there's a lot more information uh, that can be gathered from this image about the heart and the processes going on there. Uh, so in this example here, we've outlined and labeled a bunch of these different finer detailed structures. Uh, so we can see uh, the different uh, uh, processes, the vasculature, uh, as it branches from the arch of the aorta, the vena cava, uh, the different atria and ventricles of the heart. Uh, so, but uh, I'm not trying to make you a radiologist. I'm just going to give you an overview of these structures. Uh, so here we'll, we'll talk about the mediastinum and how it's divided up into different portions. Of course, there is a uh, superior mediastinum, which contains the arch of the aorta and the various uh, neurovascular processes traveling through that region. Uh, the blue part here is the pericardium, also called the uh, middle mediastinum. But there are a couple other portions we'll talk about as well. So the superior from the inferior mediastinum, separated by this imaginary line from the angle of the, uh, the sternum, uh, where the manubrium meets the uh, sternal plate, uh, through the uh, top of the heart, where the, uh, uh, the uh, great vessels travel off it, to about the anterior junction of T4, T5. So that's the imaginary line that separates superior from inferior. Superior mediastinum contains these contents. You can pause and look at those or look at the slide. Uh, but the main things are the arch of the aorta, of course, some things that travel through vagus, uh, trachea, esophagus. Anterior mediastinum contains very little. It's the portion below that imaginary line in the inferior portion, but anterior to the pericardial sac. So it's got some fat in it, um, uh, pretty much uh, not much else, maybe some lymph nodes. When you think about the uh, mediastinum, though, it's the middle mediastinum that gets most of the attention because it contains the heart within the pericardial sac, as well as all of the great vessels, uh, veins, uh, and the phrenic nerve traveling within the pericardial sac. Posterior mediastinum behind the heart is going to contain the descending aorta, as well as the esophagus traveling through to the stomach. Uh, and the various other things related with those structures that are going to end up traveling through the diaphragm through those hiatuses and foramen we talked about last time. Now let's talk about the pericardium itself in the middle mediastinum. So here to orient, this is the typical uh, anatomical view of the heart. We have the base of the heart here. The base of the heart is where the great vessels uh, come off of the superior portion of the heart. We call that the base of the heart. The apex of the heart is the bottom portion, the tip, uh, in uh, you know pointing off to the individual's left a little bit, uh, so the bottom of the ventricles. The pericardial sac contains uh, three different layers to it. The first is the fibrous pericardium, which is a tough, thick uh, kind of connective tissue that surrounds the heart. We'll see that the phrenic nerve actually travels within that fibrous pericardium. This is why the phrenic nerve is able to sense, and uh, dermatomes C3, 4, and 5 are able to sense uh, changes in activity of the heart because those sensory nerves from the phrenic nerve are traveling within that fibrous pericardium. Next, we have the parietal pericardium, adherent to the fibrous pericardium, but within it. The fibrous pericardium, uh, uh, reflects onto the surface of the heart itself, and at that point it's called the visceral pericardium. Visceral because it's closest to the visceral organ. Parietal is away from, uh, over the top of that organ. Uh, so between the visceral and parietal pericardium is the pericardial cavity. Uh, 
The pericardial cavity is a, a space that contains fluid which lubricates these layers so that as the heart pumps, it can move and expand uh, within the pericardium uh, efficiently without building up fluid and edema uh, within the heart. So this pericardial cavity has various clinical conditions associated with it, as you would imagine. If there are connective tissue adhesions between the parietal and visceral pericardium, then that restricts the movement of the heart and makes it more difficult for the heart to pump. Uh, so these adhesions are uh, negative things that are going to increase hypertrophy of the heart, increase blood pressure, those sorts of conditions. Pericarditis, of course, the inflammation uh, in this uh, heart, so it's going to cause a buildup of fluid in the pericardial cavity, relating uh, or uh, resulting in compression of the heart via this sort of uh, cardiac tamponade condition. Tamponade being the buildup of fluid in this cavity. Uh, so in order to correct for that buildup of fluid, uh, what has to be performed is a pericardiosynthesis in which fluid is drained from that pericardial cavity. So that involves the, injection, the uh, insertion of a, a hypodermic needle uh, to uh, draw out that fluid from that sac. Uh, it's usually guided by some sort of imaging, maybe ultrasound or uh, x-ray uh, imaging. <clears throat> so the surface of the heart, now that we've gone through the pericardial sac, traveled through these fibrous connective tissue layers, uh, now we see that the, uh, the visceral uh, pericardium is covering the surface of the heart. So at this point, we can't really see much of the uh, heart musculature. <clears throat> but at this point, we can see the great vessels coming off of the heart or joining the heart. And we can see some of the branching of the coronary arteries uh, that supply the heart. So first, let's talk about the regions of the heart. There are sulci uh, within the surface of the heart that separate the different um, portions, regions of the heart. The coronary sulcus is a sulcus that travels around uh, at the base of the heart circumferentially. Uh, and uh, in so doing, it separates the atria from the ventricles. So this is the coronary sulcus here at the base, near the base. The interventricular sulci uh, travel between the right and left ventricles from anterior to posterior. So there's an anterior uh, interventricular sulcus and a posterior interventricular sulcus. Within this sulci, coronary arteries travel. And so you'll be able to associate these coronary arteries with the sulci they're in and the side of the heart that you'll find them. So the first one we'll talk about is the right coronary artery located within the right coronary sulcus. Uh, so it's going to travel around the patient's right side of the heart toward the posterior surface within this sulcus. It gives off a number of branches. It gives off a marginal branch. Marginal named for the fact that it's traveling on the right margin of the heart from the, um, from the anatomical view. It will also give, so margin being the border of the heart. So it will also give off in the posterior of the heart, uh, it will give off the posterior interventricular artery that travels between the right and left ventricles on the posterior surface of the heart. Moving on, we have the left coronary artery. The left coronary artery is traveling in that coronary sulcus, will give off several branches. First of all, it gives off the uh, circumflex artery. The circumflex artery continues traveling in the coronary sulcus around to the posterior side of the heart. Uh, so it will approach uh, the limit of the right uh, coronary artery. It will also give off, the left coronary artery will also give off the anterior interventricular artery traveling in the anterior interventricular sulcus <coughs> traveling around posteriorly uh, to approach the uh, posterior interventricular artery. So the anterior interventricular, sometimes called the left anterior descending, also called the uh, widowmaker, because that artery supplies the left ventricle, and the left ventricle is 
responsible for expelling blood and pushing it throughout the rest of the body. So the right ventricle is just responsible for pushing blood into the lungs so that it gets oxygenated. But the left ventricle has to provide the force to expel blood and perfuse the entire body. So left ventricle, very important. And so this artery, uh, the cause of, uh, you know, uh, embolisms uh, in the uh, anterior interventricular artery are the cause of many fatalities from heart attacks. So we'll notice that all of these uh, branches from the left and the right uh, tend to approach each other, but it's important to note that they do not functionally anastomose with each other. So a thrombus or an embolism within the anterior interventricular artery will cause a loss of blood flow to the left ventricle. The posterior interventricular artery is not anastomosing here to resupply blood if an embolism occurs. So uh, for that reason, there, there's no functional anastomoses, even though these arteries approach each other. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'm adding in a few more little arteries. You're going to see these in dissection. They're, they're uh, visible, but they're not as important. They're not the four primary arteries, so, um, but we need to name them and understand that they're there. So coming off of the anterior interventricular artery are going to be several branches that travel horizontally, uh, which kind of follow the, the muscular patterns. And these are called septal branches. So they're just investing branches that dive deep and supply the, uh, the cardiac muscle. Then we're going to have a diagonal artery that travels off uh, perpendicular with that musculature, and it travels down toward the apex of the heart. So those are some named branches you'll see. Uh, there may be a left marginal artery. Uh, to accompany the right marginal artery, just to, you know, uh, um, symmetry in the heart. Uh, but that can be variable, um, and its size can be variable. So that's the, uh, the arterial supply of the heart, the coronary arteries you need to be aware of. The venous drainage of the heart occurs via cardiac veins, which drain into the coronary sinus. So the coronary sinus is basically a large vein that sits on the back of the heart in the coronary sulcus. Thus it's named the coronary sinus. The veins that drain into it we can see here. Uh, so the first, the largest vein that drains into it is gonna follow the circumflex and the anterior interventricular arteries. This is called the great cardiac vein. So when you think anterior interventricular artery, you also think great cardiac vein. Moving back, we have uh, some small veins that drain the posterior portion of the left ventricle. Uh, but more importantly, uh, we have the middle cardiac vein, which travels with the posterior interventricular artery. So you think posterior interventricular artery, you think middle cardiac vein. Now following uh, the right uh, coronary artery, we will have the small cardiac vein. Small cardiac vein travels with the right and uh, uh, curves down to join the marginal artery. So that's a small cardiac vein. There are also some other veins that drain the atria uh, and other smaller portions of regions of the heart. So we'll see these, the smallest cardiac vein, the uh, uh, atrial veins, the right atrial veins, left atrial veins. Um, so there's more in the right atrium, but there's very few in the left ventricle and left atrium. But these don't drain into the coronary sinus is the point. These are draining directly into the uh, heart chambers, which is why you don't have these small direct veins in the left ventricle. And that's because the left ventricle is after the, uh, the oxygenation of blood in the lungs. So the right Atrium and the right ventricle are pre-oxygenation. Uh, the uh, left atrium and left ventricle are post-oxygenation of the blood. So now get a feel for the flow of blood through the heart, of course, coming from the vena cava, the superior and inferior, into the right atrium. And we also need to understand the 
uh, the um, valves that are in the heart. So between the right atrium and the right ventricle, we have the right atrioventricular valve. Uh, traveling uh, from there to the lungs, we have the pulmonary valve going to the pulmonary arteries that go to the lungs. Uh, from there, we have pulmonary veins traveling into the left atrium, uh, and that blood will travel through the left atrioventricular uh, valve into the left ventricle. From there, the left ventricle pushes blood into the aortic arch via the aortic valve. Now, there are some traditional names that you'll still hear used, um, which uh, you'll have to be for that reason, you'll have to know. So, um, these aren't too difficult, but we need to work on them. So, the right AV valve is the tricuspid, the left AV valve is the bicuspid or mitral valve, and that's for the number of cusps that form the valve, um, which isn't as helpful as knowing what the valve is between. You'd want to, I, so I don't know why they bothered to name it this originally anyway, but we have what we have and we have to use it. Then the uh, pulmonary valve and the aortic valve are both called semilunar valves, also not helpful. So anyway, be aware of this terminology. I am going to use the more precise uh, atrioventricular uh, valves when I talk about uh, these, these structures, etc., etc., aortic or pulmonary. So when talking about the heart, of course, we have to talk about auscultation of the heart. Where do we listen for these heart sounds? Where do they project on the surface anatomy, and how can we locate those? So uh, we see the apex of the heart is in the fifth intercostal space. We see the base of the heart is uh, about the level of the third costal cartilages. So from there, we can now take a look at these different valves uh, and these uh, different, um, uh, the atria and ventricles and see where it's best, uh, these are best heard. So the uh, aortic valve, aortic semilunar valve, uh, is actually at about behind the sternum at about the third costal cartilage, but it, that heart sound is most easily heard in the right uh, second intercostal space. So if you want to pal the, uh, auscultate that valve, you'll palpate down from the manubrium to the second intercostal space, uh, put the stethoscope there, listen to the functions of that valve, listen for the whooshing sounds and, and uh, flapping sounds and whatnot, depending on how it's doing. The uh, pulmonary semilunar valve is going to be on the left side in the second intercostal space. Now uh, going for the, um, the right atrioventricular valve, also called the tricuspid, uh, it's going to project below the uh, xiphoid process of the sternum. Uh, so palpate for that xiphoid process and the costal cartilages associated with it and uh, you can auscultate that uh, at that location. Probably the um, most important valve uh, in the heart because it uh, releases blood to the rest of the body is going to be the left, uh, uh, or sorry, uh, the left atrioventricular valve between the left atrium and the left ventricle. So uh, I, I was uh, initially thinking about the aortic valve. Uh, but anyway, the bicuspid valve or mitral valve, which I'm talking about now, um, the left atrioventricular valve is its other name, uh, can be auscultated below the fifth uh, costal cartilages on the left side. Uh, so there you have it. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to take a quick break before we talk about the uh, internal anatomy of the heart. So thanks for listening.